Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Just got a few announcements before we get started. Uh, welcome to the Enric Tech Talk on state-of-the-art modeling and simulation to support advanced record deployment. My name is Abdullah Bujaudeh, and I'm the Enric Work Package Manager for the Virtual Testbed, or VTB for short, and I'll be moderating this event. Um, can everybody hear me fine? If anybody, if people can't hear me, please ping me um, separately. I'm not assuming everybody can hear me okay. Uh, before we get started, I have to go through a couple of items uh, so that you know how to participate in today's event. Uh, for the best experience, please turn off any VPN or Citrus connection. Please submit any questions by typing your question to the section in the control panel. You may send questions at any time during the presentation, and we will address them at the end during the Q&A session. For any technical issues, please contact Emily Nichols. Her email address is in the chat box. Um, or for any programmatic question, you can send them to enric at inl.gov. This event will be recorded and provided on the Enric website. Our speakers for today will be myself, Derek Gaston, and Guillaume Guilicelli from INL, and April Novak from Arlo National Laboratory. In the interest of time, the panelist biography can be found on the link, registration link that uh, you use to sign up. So and now I'll go ahead and start with the first talk of the presentation. All righty, so let's get going. So I'm going to be giving you all a overview of the virtual testbed first. Oops, sorry. Um, so, as you are probably familiar, ENRIC is a new initiative at the Department of Energy that aims to deliver uh, a successful demonstration and deployment of advanced nuclear technology. Uh, the organization does so with two different uh, type of test beds. Some of them are physical, like the EBR2 Dome project or the Zipper Lotus facility, and there's a virtual arm called the Virtual Test Bed, or VTB for short, and that's what we're talking about today. It's a collaboration with NEMS and it aims to accelerate deployment of, of, of advanced reactors by leveraging state-of-the-art modeling and simulation tools developed by the DOE program. Um, so what is it really? So we support React demonstration with two main, uh, in two main ways. One is by developing new models that solve key tools that are important for potential demonstrators and provide the basis for safety reviews in the future. And the second is by hosting a lot of these models in an online repository that's open and available to everyone. Oops, sorry. And just a quick overview of the VTB team. Uh, this picture of myself, Abdallah. Uh, I'm also working on different projects uh, on salt irradiation and SANI techno-economics. Uh, and I'm also the new uh, CRAB lead for the NEMS program as well. Uh, Derek is my co-lead at INL. He's also the deputy director at the NEMS program. Cody Permit is the repo manager and the department uh, manager for the computational frameworks department. Guillaume and Mauricio are uh, the points of contact for FHR and MSR technology, and Guillaume is a technical lead helping with setting up the repository and maintaining it. On the Argon side, I'm joined by Bo Fang, uh, who, who used to be the lead and is now the National Technical Director for the DOE Fast Reactor Program, and is being replaced by Emily Shimon, um, who is also the NEMS Multiphysics Application Lead. April Novak, another speaker today, is an uh, Argon Distinguished Postdoc, and is one of the key developers on the, the Argon side, as well as June Fang, who's a developer as well on the Argon side. And we've gotten contributions from a lot of external parties as well, I'm highlighting the box on the right. So the repository is officially live, so I, I uh, invite you all to go to mooseframework.inl.gov slash virtual underscore test underscore bed, uh, where you can access it. The repository is three main things. Uh, one is documentation, so there's a web page with a lot of information containing uh, contain about the models, and I'll do a quick walkthrough in a, at the end of my talk. Um, the second thing is a GitHub repo where you can easily access and clone files and meshes and things of that nature. And third is integration with code development framework. So just to elaborate a bit more on the last point, uh, we've set up a complete test suite integration that's integrated completely with the QA process of a lot of the codes being developed by the NEMS program. As you're probably all aware, NEMS is developing capabilities very rapidly, and that can lead to obsolescence of models. Um, so what we've done is integrated all of the reference models on the virtual test bed, so different examples for sodium fast reactors, MSR, HEGRs. Um, so whenever a new update is pushed, say, on a code like Griffin, uh, it checks for the input files on the VTB and makes sure that things are compatible, and vice versa. Uh, when we put a new model on the, on the virtual test bed, you can be assured that it's compatible with the latest version of the codes um, thanks to this automated civet platform testing infrastructure. 
Um, so B Derek Gaston, following my presentation, will be giving a lot of talk about the NIMS tools, but I'll just quickly highlight them here. Uh, there's a range of modeling and simulation efforts going on at, in that program. Uh, you can couple different ones of them, like Griffin and Neck for high fidelity analysis, or with Pronghorn for multi-physics transients. You can leverage SAM for balance of plant analysis, or something like Bison and Yellow Jacket for fuel performance. So the idea is that you can plug and play different types of physics together uh, for advanced reactor modeling and simulation. Um, so the current advanced reactor landscape, as you probably are aware, is very diversified. We have quite a lot of uh, uh, ARDP, so Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program applicants and awardees, and they, they're almost pretty evenly split between a wide variety of reactor types. And the situation is even more complicated with all the uh, other demonstrations being planned, uh, such as in the NASA's Propulsion and Fission Surface Power Initiative and DOD projects as well. Uh, so the virtual testbed, we're hoping to try and support all of these initiatives, uh, essentially. Now, I won't go into details about the current status of all the modeling and simulation codes. You can go, you can find out more info at INL slash EXT-21-63162. Uh, but the main purpose I wanted to highlight here in the slide is obviously uh, there's a lot of work and development still going on. We, we've done a lot of great advancement in the, in the capabilities with the NEMS tools. But there's still some gaps to be addressed. So um, stay tuned and, and be patient with us as we update the codes and provide more capabilities in the future. So this is an overview of different models being hosted, and uh, April will be providing a bit more details about each and every one of them later on. Uh, we've got a wide range of examples showcased from high temperature gas reactors, fluoride high temperature reactors, MSRs, molten salt reactors, sorry, sodium fast reactors, SFRs, and heat pipe micro reactors, HPMRs, and there's a wide range of different use cases as well. Now I'm showing them here in a different layout, in a tree layout, just to give you a, a sense of what, we currently what we're currently hosting and how you're interacting with the virtual repository repo. Uh, so first you have to pick a reactor type. So say you pick MSRs, then you have different examples for MSRs, one thermal, one fast. And then each of these will have different use cases showcased basically. And you can see here, there's a wide variety of codes that you can mix and match basically and use as Lego blocks to build new models in the future. And Guillaume Guidicelli will be giving us a tutorial on how to do that uh, at the end of this, this uh, tech talk. So what are our goals and what's the VTV's purposes? Uh, one key goal is to accelerate demonstration timelines uh, by de-risking models and setting up the groundwork for uh, advanced reactor modeling and simulation. We're also pushing for cross-collaboration across as government, and especially in the area of, of modeling and simulation and help reduce redundancies. And we're trying to benefit a wide range of users by making all these models accessible to the wider community so we can harness the community as a whole to solve big challenge problems as we all work towards deploying advanced reactors in the future. Uh, on the medium term, we're hoping a lot of the work we're doing here will uh, help set up the foundation and the groundwork for potential DOE authorization and NRC review. So we're trying to figure out all of the bugs early on and some of the challenges early on. And in the long run, we're hoping that uh, we can play a crucial role in code validation when demonstrations start coming online. So when NREC starts to operate these, some of these uh, demonstration concepts in their test beds, uh, the VTD can bring back some of the data to developers to help validate the codes and increase confidence in them. So that's the key vision of VTD. So how do you get involved? Um, well, there's some guidelines on the link I'm showing above, and I'll point you to it on the website shortly. Uh, but it's pretty straightforward, so the VTB is completely open, so you can download a model from there, or you can just build your own. Uh, then you can tweak it uh, locally on a VTB, uh, sorry, on a VTB branch or locally on your computer, develop new capabilities as part of a PhD or industry use case. Uh, then you can submit your model and the corresponding documentation to the VTB main branch. We'll review it and test it to make sure that uh, things are compatible with the latest version of the codes, and then voila, your new model will be available on the virtual testbed. Uh, but why should you contribute models to the virtual testbed? Uh, the first benefit is that you will allow the wider community to benefit from your new developments. Rather than people just reading your results on a paper, people can actually go and play around with your tools and benefit from them. You can gain all synergies by leveraging what other people are doing too. Say you have a very good SAM model and somebody else has a great Griffin model of the same reactor, then you can both, uh, oops, sorry, um, both uh, merge your capabilities together and uh, set up a, 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 complica a more complex multi-physics example. Uh, and the last advantage is that you ensure that your codes and your input file will, are, will be continuously updated with the latest version of the code. So anything that's in the virtual testbed will be completely integrated with our testing suite and will be updated as uh, new capabilities are being developed. 
So just to summarize real quick, uh, the repository is up and live, and we encourage you to go to visit it at mooseframework.ina.gov slash virtual underscore test underscore bed. Uh, we're really excited to have external people contribute, so please reach out if you're interested. Uh, there's a host of challenge problem up there showcasing different codes, like Griffin, Pronghorn, Sam, Neck, Sakai, and Bison. We have a wide range of reactor types considered from FHRs, MSRs, sodium fast reactors to micro reactors. We've we have a, a bunch of examples in terms of steady state, multi-physics, transient analysis, component analysis, high fidelity CFD, so a wide variety of different examples. And all of these should provide you with the building blocks to set up your own use cases. Um, so you can start with your, your, your closest model to yours of interest. You can change the mesh, tweak some of the specs, and then rerun your use case, and Guillaume will show you just how to do that. Um, alternatively, you can use some of the higher fidelity case to inform uh, some lower fidelity models that you're running, say, on, on your for your purposes. Uh, or you can try to couple two different capabilities that haven't been coupled yet together. So they're already up there, and you can work towards leveraging them together. So um, after I give you guys a walkthrough, you'll, just to give you an overview of today's uh, session, Derek will give you an overview of the NEMS tools, then April, an overview of the models in the VTB, and Guillaume will give you a tutorial. But before that, let me give you a quick walkthrough. And if you have any question, my email here is here and also in the chat box. So please feel free to reach out if we didn't have time to address your question. So hopefully you guys can still see my screen. This is the uh, virtual testbed website. This is the, the home page. once you get in. There's a bit of a blurb about the description about the models, uh, what the virtual testbed is. Some instructions about how to use the virtual testbed, some frequently asked questions link here. And here's the link to a guideline. So what, what are the minimum requirements that we ask users to provide for a new contribution to the VTB? Um, then here is where you can find the documentation of all the different reactor types. Let me pick one for just for now, just to show you how this thing works. So I'm picking the molten salt reactor example. Then I'm here, I have the option between the MSRE uh, thermal reactor and the molten salt fast reactor. So I'll pick the, this one. You can see that the, then there's a bunch of different tabs here. Um, first, let's go through the description of the reactor model. It's showing here references and what, what the reactor looks like. Going back, uh, then we have a pronghorn griffin model coupled together and Mauricio here is highlighted as the point of contact for that model. Um, you can see here a lot of detailed description about the equations being solved. Here it's conservation of mass. And then this is the block corresponding to in the input deck uh, for, for that particular case. Um, moving forward, this is the Navier-Stokes equation, scrolling down. And then here you have a description of every single block in the equations that we're solving. So the advection term is the first block. Second block is the uh, pressure gradient. Third and fourth block are the Reynolds stress and viscous tensor. And then uh, finally, there's a mixing length model as well as an approximation for turbulence modeling too. And now going to the very, um, back to the main page of the repository, you can see here there's a note giving you a link to the GitHub repository. So if I click on that, you can see the GitHub uh, mirror uh, page for the virtual testbed here with instructions and the disclaimer. And then if I want to find that MSR model, I just click on this folder, uh, MSFR, and then the input for the work I was considering is over here. And you can see here the input file. So with that, I'll, I'll hand off to Derek Gaston who will describe the codes in more detail. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Abdallah. So let me just get my screen shared here. Are we just seeing a white box or is that just me? Now go. I'm seeing. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Derek Gaston, and I'm the NEMS Deputy National Technical Director at INL. And I'm also the VTB co lead, basically, just the interface um, between the VTB and NEMS. 
And today I'm just going to give a very, very quick overview of some of the codes that are utilized within the virtual testbed. So first, a, a quick overview of the NEMS program itself. This is the Nuclear Energy Advanced Modeling and Simulation Program. It's a DOE program to uh, develop and deploy predictive simulation tools for nuclear reactors. And in particular, we're focused on some of the more complex phenomenon like multi-scale fuel performance um, and structural materials degradation coupled to reactor physics and thermal fluids. And in order to do this, we're developing a wide range of tools that are all interoperable so that they can be utilized to go after different reactor phenomenon and different reactor types. And to do that, we use two main platforms. So for our non-LWR analysis, we're util utilizing the Moose framework. Um, and for all of our LWR simulation needs, we utilize the, the Vera simulation suite, uh, which was originally developed by Castle. Now today we're going to be mostly focusing on some of the advanced reactor models within the virtual testbed, um, which are built utilizing the Moose-based tools. So let's talk just a little bit more about Moose. So Moose is the multi-physics object-oriented simulation environment. We've been developing it now for nearly 14 years, which is pretty crazy to me. Um, and the whole idea here is to enable rapid development of new simulation tools. And it has a very rigorous uh, software quality component to it, where we run over 20 million tests per week in order to uh, allow the development of Moose and the Moose-based applications to, uh, to move forward and, and always work together. Um, what we wanted to do is enable scientists and engineers to be able to focus on the physics that they want to solve instead of worrying so much about numerical implementation. And therefore, uh, a scientist or an engineer utilizing Moose can simulate uh, something like a nuclear reactor flow without having to worry about how to utilize MPI or solvers within PETSI or something like that. Moose takes care of those, of those parts of the solve for them. And one of the unique capabilities of Moose is that it seamlessly couples other Moose-based applications together, utilizing this capability called multi-apps and transfers, which you'll hear more about um, throughout the next couple of talks. And we can even bring in non-Moose-based codes in order to couple them into couple them with the rest of the Moose-based codes by doing something called Moose wrapping them, which again you'll hear more about momentarily. Um, we've had a lot of success with Moose, including several awards. There's well over 500 publications at my last count um, that, that have been published using Moose. We get about 1,500 unique visitors to the website every week. So it's a very active, um, very active uh, project. So to get an idea of the, the breadth of activity within NEMS, this is showing um, in pink there all of the codes, uh, all of the Moose-based codes that, that NEMS is developing. And the way that we do this is that they're all based on the Moose framework at the top. And then the Moose repository also comes with a set of common physics modules um, that all of the codes uh, can reuse. Things that are very common like solid mechanics, heat conduction, uh, fluid flow, et cetera, right? That multiple applications will need. And then on top of that, we build uh, the codes that you see in pink there, such as Bison, Griffin, Pronghorn, Sockeye, uh, which are some of the tools that are utilized within the virtual testbed. And since they're all Moose-based applications, they can all be coupled to each other. So even though they're doing individual, they're, they're simulating individual pieces of reactor or phenomenon within reactors, they can be mixed and matched in order to go after different reactor types, like all the ones seen at the bottom of the screen here. Um, and as I mentioned, we can bring in non-Moose-based tools such as NEC 5000 and OpenMC um, by uh, doing what we call moose wrapping them. And then that enables them to then be coupled to any of, any of the other moose-based applications. Um, and we have, last, lastly here, we have some coupling applications such as Direwolf, which bring together multiple moose-based applications into one package, uh, in this case, to go after uh, micro, heat pipe microreactor simulations. Okay, so with, with that idea of how we develop the codes, let's dive in and just talk a little bit about each one of the codes. We don't have a lot of time here, so it's going to be very quick. So first of all, we have SAM, which is our modern systems analysis code. 
Um, it's a flexible multi-scale multi-physics code that lets you do um, system loops, cores, and uh, large volume modeling. Um, this is being used uh, by the NRC, and it also received its own uh, R&D award in uh, 2019. And keep in mind that each one of these tools can be coupled to all the other Moose-based tools. So if, in particular, SAM can be coupled to Pronghorn, which is our medium fidelity uh, flow simulation tool uh, for doing engineering scale flows uh, within nuclear reactors. And Pronghorn um, has sub-channel capability. It pulls in porous medium flow capability, uh, free flow capability with Navier-Stokes and the thermal hydraulics module. And what it's doing is it's solving engineering scale or medium fidelity flows um, that are um, backed by models such as um, boundary flow models and things like that that are built from higher fidelity CFD models um, which we pull in generally from NEC 5000, which is our high fidelity CFD tool within NEMS. Uh, now NEC 5000 is not a moose based tool. Um, it's a extremely high performance, massively parallel, um, high fidelity CFD tool um, that has been around for a while. And we have been able to utilize it within the NEMS system by wrapping it with Moose, and then we are able to couple it with other Moose-based tools. We're also able to utilize it um, to develop lower link scale informed uh, models that then get put into Pronghorn um, so that we can run faster running medium fidelity uh, fluid flow with Pronghorn. And then our reactor physics tool within NEMS is called Griffin. Uh, this is a joint effort between Argonne National Laboratory and Idaho National Laboratory. And the idea is that we took a lot of existing capability at both of those laboratories and put them together in order to make this uh, new Griffin tool. Um, it's a very flexible tool with multiple different transport and um, diffusion solvers within it. It can do um, both 2D and 3D transport, very flexible geometry wise. Um, and it of course can be coupled to all the other moose based tools um, in order to have a complete multi-physics simulation of your reactor. One of the oldest Moose-based tools is the Bison code, which is our nuclear fuel performance tool that we developed within NEMS. Um, this is a, a very flexible tool that utilizes lower link scale informed models to give us predictive simulation capability for all types of nuclear fuel, including UO2, metal fuel, triso fuel, um, and and um, yeah, I guess that's it for Bison. <laughs> Very flexible tool. Uh, next is Grizzly. Uh, Grizzly is a moose-based simulation tool that does degradation of system components. That includes um, really any internal components inside of a reactor, but in particular, it's been utilized for reactor pressure vessels. So given something like a, a fluence map from a, from a neutronics code, um, Grizzly can do things like compute probability of failure over time within uh, reactor pressure vessels. And of course, uh, it can link to many of the other tools here that, that I've talked about. Lastly is uh, Sakai. Sakai is our heat pipe uh, simulation tool, obviously utilized for simulations of heat pipe microreactors. And the, the primary model is a 1D flow model um, that can do phase change, of course, uh, which is required for uh, modeling all types of, of heat pipes. It can be coupled to a 2D conduction model. Um, and then that can further be coupled out to larger uh, reactor scale heat conduction models and embedded within uh, Griffin simulations uh, for feedback back to neutronics, et cetera. Um, so this obviously forms a cornerstone, is a cornerstone capability uh, for our heat pipe microreactor simulation needs. And then, oops, missing a slide. Ah, there we go. And then you might be asking, how can you get access to all of these tools? So the virtual test bed has within it a bunch of models that are developed um, as, uh, as examples, et cetera. Um, but it doesn't provide the actual 
uh, codes themselves that are needed to run those models. So in order to get access to those models, um, uh, access to the codes, a large number of them, you can apply for access at this NCRC website, the Nuclear Computational Resource Center, which is hosted by Idaho National Laboratory. And you, you can get to it at inl.gov slash NCRC. And the way that it works is that you effectively register and make requests um, for many of the Moose base codes. Um, this is a, a new development, a new capability that, that NEMS is funding. And uh, there's a major revision of it planned um, that, that's going to widen the scope of it some um, uh, later this summer. Um, but many of the Moose base tools are already available there. So if you're trying to get access, um, head there first. So in summary, NEMS is developing a really wide array of interoperable simulation tools. I went over, what, like eight of them very, very quickly. Um, you'll hear more about each one of those tools as we go through the next few talks. Um, so hopefully I just gave you a little bit of understanding of what each one was. The virtual testbed then provides a set of open inputs for these tools. Those open inputs are examples for using the tools, their challenge problems, their benchmark calculations. Hopefully it can be used as a collaboration space for working collaboratively on models utilizing these tools. And then ultimately, as Abdallah mentioned, um, hopefully they'll be used as uh, validation tools uh, later on uh, once we get a lot of data coming back from these advanced reactor deployment um, programs. And as I mentioned just a moment ago, you can obtain the tools um, through the NCRC. So that's what I have. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Derek. Our next speaker will be April. She'll be giving us an overview of the models on the virtual testbed. Go ahead, April. Thank you. You can see my screen. Oops. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Thanks, everyone. My name is April Novak from Argonne National Lab. I'm going to be providing an overview of the VTB models currently available in the repository. After me, Guillaume is going to do a deep dive into one of these models. So my purpose here is just to introduce you to the diversity of models currently available in the repository. Um, and really to emphasize the plug and play nature of the NEMS tools. I won't have enough time to go into a very, very detailed description of each of the models, but if you're more interested in them, please consult the, the website for documentation. So the models in the virtual test bed span a quite varied categories of reactors. So right now we have five different reactors covered. These include sorry. HGGRs, oh, sorry. Yeah, I, you can see, well, I think your, your screen is, uh, can you unshare and share again, maybe? Yes. Can you see the screen now? Maybe it was an issue yeah, with PowerPoint. Presenter so presenter mode. No, sorry, that? go ahead and share screen. Oh, it's doing the same thing again. Really? Sorry. I mean, is it okay if we just do this for the sake of time? Yep. Sorry for the distraction on the sidebar. Okay, let me make it a little bigger. Okay, so we have five different reactor types currently covered in the VTB. We have high temperature gas reactors, a heat pipe micro reactor, fluoride salt cooled pebble bed reactors, molten salt reactors, and sodium fast reactors. So I'm gonna provide just one slide about each of these different models currently available emphasizing the plug and play nature of those models in terms of the tools that are used, the physics domains that are covered. And for each case, I'm gonna try and point out one or two interesting aspects of the modeling and simulation setup that highlight um, general capabilities and memes tools that you might find interesting in applying for your own analyses. So broader, broader scopes than narrow focus on the particular reactor type. I do wanna say upfront that the virtual test bed is really a pedagogical tool for learning how to use means tools. And most of these inputs have not been extensively validated and tested. Um, they're really meant as a, a launching point for adopting for other systems, swapping in and out components, meshes, geometries, um, and really adapting things for follow-on studies. So with that, I will get started. I'm gonna start with the molten salt reactor models. So the first model I'll talk about is from the Euratom EVOL project. This is a coupling of Griffin multigroup diffusion with Pronghorn finite volume Navier Stokes. Griffin's cross sections come from Serpent. Pronghorn is solved with Navier Stokes equations with a zero equation mixing length model. 
So pronghorn is going to advect the delayed neutron precursors from Griffin, and they're coupled together on every time step. So in the top right there is an image of pronghorn fluid velocity and temperature, and then Griffin's delayed neutron precursors in the middle row there. What's interesting about this model is that it uses both a steady state and transient coupling. Um, and the coupling is used for a reduced pump force, so loss of flow simulation, which is controlled by the control system in Moose. This is a system in Moose that allows you to modify geometry, boundary conditions, functions, lots of other things that make up a simulation as the function of time. So this is a very general feature for a lot of different types of transient simulations. Also included for the MSFR is a standalone RANS NEC-RS model. Um, and this model shown on the bottom there, the comparison between the neck and pronghorn velocities, is used to tune that mixing lake uh, closure in pronghorn. So this is also a really great example for how NEMS tools can be used for multi-scale analysis doing that high to low pipeline workflow. Also in the MSR space, we have a systems level thermal hydraulics model of the MSRE experiment using SAM. So this model consists of three different loops, so a primary loop, a secondary loop, and then air-cooled radiators. Um, so this is a steady state model containing lots of different components, and it's a really great introduction to SAM. So in the picture there is the fluid temperature predicted by SAM in one of those loops. Moving to the HTGR cases, we have an example for the OECD PBMR 400 benchmark, which couples Griffin multigroup diffusion with pronghorn Navier Stokes. Here, the pronghorn model uses the finite element discretization instead of finite volume in the MSR case I introduced uh, a few slides ago. And we solve the porous media equations with various closures obtained from pebble bed experiments. So this example has both steady state and transient pressurized loss of forced cooling examples. So a picture of the benchmark geometry shown in the top right and some select results in the bottom right for fast and thermal flux, power density, and various thermal hydraulic conditions. So this example is unique among the ones I'll talk about today because there is a comparison among other benchmark experiments, benchmark participants for this um, this uh, this code-to-code -code experiment. Um, and you can also use this example to contrast different settings in pronghorn. So pronghorn has both finite volume and finite element capabilities. So you can compare this to the MSFR one to see how that different discretization appears in the input file. Also in the HTGR space, we have a 1D fan model of the MHTGR design. So this is a steady state model that consists of two loops, primary and um, I believe there's a secondary loop. And what's unique about this model is that in the primary loop, there is a 2D representation of the solid. So you get a little bit higher dimension of that solid temperature coupling to the fluid. Okay, moving to the FHR space, the first model we'll talk about is a coupling of Griffin and Pronghorn for the Berkeley Mark, uh, Mark 1 design. So Griffin solves multigroup diffusion with cross sections from Serpent, and Pronghorn is solving Navier Stokes finite volume with the porous media equations with various pebble bed closures. So this one contrasts with the, the PBMR example in now that we have two different pebble beds, but we're using finite volume instead of finite element. So on the bottom right there are, so, are some select results for fast and thermal flux and temperatures. So what I really like about this example is that it shows the diversity of using the multi-app system in Moose. Here we're using the multi-app system to not only couple physics, so coupling Griffin and Pronghorn, but also coupling scales. So we use multi-apps here to couple porous media on the full bed scale to pebble heat conduction, which is then coupled to triso heat conduction. So you have this multi-layered approach here that really shows the flexibility of this system. Also for the FHR, we have a SAM 1D systems level model of the Berkeley design. So this case includes steady state and transient. So in the bottom right is the fluid temperature at a certain time into a loss of flow transient. And last for the FHR space, we have a model of a component. So here we're looking at a subsection of the outer reflector looking at bypass flow by coupling neck RS to moose heat conduction. And this is an example here of that wrapping approach you've heard a little bit about, we are wrapping NECRS within the Moose framework with an application called Cardinal. So some select results are shown on the bottom there for Moose solid temperature, neck fluid temperature, and pressure. So this is a good example for learning more about what the external problem system is in Moose, how you would wrap a non-Moose tool into the Moose framework, which really gives you so much flexibility if there's another application like molecular dynamics or discrete element modeling that you want to bring into the Moose framework, this would be a good starting point for learning how to do that. 
In the SFR space, sodium fast reactor space, we have a coupling for a simple single fuel bundle. So this is coupling Griffin multigroup diffusion with Bison heat conduction, Moose tensor mechanics to model fuel axial expansion and grid plate radial expansion, and then SAM for representative coolant channel. Um, so some select results for a full core extension of this is shown in the bottom right there for Griffin power density and the tensor mechanics axial displacement. This example really showcases Moose's dimension agnostic features because it couples 1D, 2DRZ, and 3D models all together in the same simulation. And if you contrast this with other inputs in the virtual test bed, you'll see a lot of similarities here, and I think you'll get a really good understanding of how you can combine solutions on different dimensions. In addition, this case couples applications in a somewhat interesting way. So the ones I've talked about before, the examples I've highlighted already, when two tools are coupled together, it's generally on every time step or every end time steps. Here, we also include an initialization solve. So we are solving one of these apps just at the beginning to get an initial condition, and that is then applied for all subsequent time steps. So this highlights a lot of the flexibility in Moose as well. And finally, for the heat pipe microreactor, we have a coupling of bison heat conduction with sockeye for the heat pipes. So in the top right is a uh, diagram of the core, the one sixth geometry, so the sockeye predictions for temperature, and then um, bison predictions for solid temperature in the bottom right. So this example also really showcases the multi-app system in that we represent, we build a model for just one of these heat pipes, but then we repeat it an arbitrary number of times, hundreds of times in the core, um, and transfer data to and from all these different substructures together. But the setup is really easy to understand, and it's easy to extend this to systems with lots of substructures like pebbles, or really a lot of pin type geometries fit this category. So that closes all the models currently available in the virtual test bed. Just to summarize, there are seven different tools currently represented, Griffin, Pronghorn, NEC, SAM, Bison, Sockeye, and then the various modules in Moose, like tensor mechanics or heat conduction. And these are really combined together in a plug and play manner. On each of these code names here, the dark blue font indicates a standalone model. So we had a standalone NEC MSFR model, but then the dashed lines show how these different codes are combined together. So we have three different examples for coupling Pronghorn and Griffin. And then Griffin itself is coupled to Moose, Bison, and SAM for an SFR. And they really swap in and out with one another in a nice way. And if you compare the inputs among each other, I think you'll, you'll get a sense of that. In terms of the multi-scale thermal fluid hierarchy in NEMS, we have systems, porous media, and RANs covered currently in the virtual test bed with LES coming soon. So it also covers a wide scope of discretization approximations here. Just to summarize some general use features that really transcend any specific reactor type or even the nuclear engineering disciplines. These tutorials cover how to generate meshes with both commercial software and with Moose, how to couple applications with the multi-app system, and how do you conserve quantities like power or flux when transferring that data, and how do you control how those applications interact in time, every time step, every end time steps at the start or the end. In addition, the multi-app system is really dimension agnostic, in terms of the coupling, and these applications can usually solve in various dimensions um, quite interchangeably. We talked a little bit about how to change simulation parameters in time using the control system, which opens the door to a lot of different transient simulations. And finally, we briefly talked about wrapping non-moose codes with the external problem system. Coming soon, we have a few different models. So I've just selected a, a few to showcase. Um, and pique your interest to stay tuned as we continue developing the repository. Um, in the pebble bed space, we will have a fly cooled bed with 1500 pebbles modeled with NECRS. We will have online depletion tracking with Griffin. In the prismatic gas space, we'll have a single assembly coupling of OpenMC, THM, and Moose using Cardinal. We'll have the HTDR benchmark coupling of Griffin, Relap, and Bison. For the SFR case, we'll have an LES NEC model of a 61 pin assembly and Moose tensor mechanics modules for structural deformation of the IAEA benchmarks. And in the material space, we'll have a triso-particle fuel performance model using Bison and aging of LWR pressure vessels using Grizzly. So there's a lot to stay tuned for, and I hope that um, you got in a sense of the various models in the virtual test bed, some unique features that they use that really take the next step beyond tutorials 
already available for MOOCs or the individual physics tools. This is really about combining them together to do the complex analyses we need for nuclear engineering. And with that, I will hand it over to Guillaume. Thanks. Thanks, April. Right before Guillaume starts, I just want to thank the audience for providing questions. We'll, we'll address all of them at the Q&A session. Please, a uh, reminder, type them in the question box and uh, we'll get to them after Guillaume's presentation. Guillaume, the floor is yours. Is it sharing properly? Yeah, it looks fine. Okay, so hi everyone and welcome to the tutorial part of this uh, NREC SAC talk. So I'm a computational scientist here at ANL. I joined the lab about uh, 18 months ago. So this tutorial is going to be um, composed of four different parts. Um, first, we'll go through a quick overview of the resources that are there when you're not in a tutorial and you want to use the virtual testbed. Then we're going to present uh, my model, which is the MK1, the one I'm developing, the MK1 FHR Griffin from home core multiphysics uh, simulation. And using this model, we'll show how you go from a VTB model to your model from uh, an input file that is that we host to something that you use for your simulation needs. And then finally, we're going to look at how you can couple uh, two VTB models together uh, with the SAM pronghorn coupling. So as, as was mentioned before, SAM is for the balance of plant analysis and pronghorn is for the core um, thermal hydraulics, the coarse mesh thermal hydraulics. So let's go on the website. Um, so that's the first page you land on the VTB. And if you want basically instructions uh, for when um, it's not a tutorial, they are here, how to use the VTB, you clone using Git, then you go to the folder that you care about. This is how to use the, the NIMS tool that's relevant for the application for the input file. And then finally, there's like some explications about what we're going to do today, which is adapt the model for your, uh, your simulation. All right, so let's get right to it and dive into, and dive into the models. So we're at the, on the virtual testbed, we just cloned it, and we're going to navigate to um, the models. And so you see, we're in the folder for the PBFHR steady state model, and you see all these input files, the .i extension, that's the moose-like input files. But you know, first, it's a little yeah. bit small. You might make it just a little bit bigger, either right. the window or the font. There Is that go. good enough? Yeah, I think it's probably helping. Okay, how much can I go? All right, but first let's look at the at the geometry. So let's open that file. So that's um, our view file. There you go. Okay, is that, yeah, that's still sharing properly. Okay, so here's our geometry for this model. So uh, you can see in green, there's a pebble bed, a fueled pebble bed. So the pebbles entering through the bottom of the core uh, and then they exit through the defueling chute at the top. Uh, and the salt does the same thing. The salt comes through the bottom of the core, except it leaves mostly through a plenum here in yellow. And then, um, so this is a 2D RZ model. The axis of symmetry is here in the middle. So this is an inner reflector. This is a control rod channel in red. And then there's an outer reflector in magenta. And in pink, there's um, uh, fire bricks, uh, which is a thermal insulator. All right, so let's look at what the input files look like. So um, we open the Neutronics input file. Um, actually, it's pretty good to look at the documentation right now. So this, all these input files are documented uh, as Abdallah showed. Uh, so for the PBFHR for this model, uh, we have first what the coupling looks like. So this coupling is Griffin coupled to Pronghorn in a tight coupling mode. So Griffin computes the power distribution. So Griffin is a neutronic solver. It solves the transport equation, gets the power distribution, gives it to Pronghorn. Pronghorn uses this heat source to compute the flow field and get the temperature distribution, gives it back to Griffin, which updates um, the cross sections with it and the densities. And then it can go back um, and it iterates until it's uh, until convergence. And at the same time, Pronghorn also runs um, 
small heat conduction applications. So it runs basically Pebbles models for, uh, for fuel performance in various locations of the core. Uh, so that's, that's kind of a multi-scale approach. These two are macro solvers and this is a mesoscale solver. Uh, and then each input file is described um, in the, on the website and it's basically uh, the snippets from the input file intertwined with text explaining, but since I'm here, we can just look at the input file. So let's look at that. So this is the Neutronics input file. So if you're familiar with Moose inputs, they all look like a bit similar. Uh, so it's, uh, you can define sort of variables, same as in Python or scripting language, uh, but mostly the work happens inside blocks. Uh, so for example, for Griffin, this is the most important block. This is a transport systems block, and that defines what uh, problem you're solving. So here it says, so it's going to be a neutron, a neutron diffusion problem. We're going to use a continuous finite element. Uh, it's going to be an eigenvalue calculation. So that means that this, uh, we're going to be looking for the multiplication factor basically in this coupled uh, multiphysics simulation. And then uh, here you define the boundary conditions. So this was the axis of symmetry. So it's a reflecting surface and then the others are vacuum. So vacuum boundaries. Then you load the mesh. Uh, so this is done by this block, a file mesh generator. It loads, uh, it loads the mesh, then there's some, uh, there's some refining going in. So this is uh, refining it twice. So it's a times 16 basically. Uh, and then some modifications. So you can see that block, for example, is deleting, uh, is deleting part of the domain. And that's because it's too far from the fueled region. So it doesn't matter for neutronics. Um, then we define a couple uh, auxiliary variables, which are just fields. Um, so multi-dimensional fields that sort of um, define other quantities in the, in the input. So this is the solid phase temperature. This is the salt temperature, the control rod insertion over the control rod region, uh, and then the power densities. Some of these fields can be computed directly using auxiliary kernels. So these just act on auxiliary variables and just set their values. So for example, this is a very simple one. If you want the total power density, you got to get the sum of the power density and the decay heat, basically the fission power, fission power and decay heat. Um, there's a little more, another action to handle power scalings uh, in a very short manner. Then the materials block. For neutronics, materials means, um, means group cross-sections. So, um, Hopefully you're familiar with the concept of cross section. So it's basically a probability of interaction between neutrons and materials. Um, and what we're using here is a coupled feedback neutronics material. Basically what it means is that it's, it's tabulated against these quantities, the solid phase temperature, the salt phase, the salt temperature, the control rod insertion, and that's for every region. Uh, so this is how we access so the, the multi-group uh, cross-section library. So you see that for every region, so the reflectors, the vessel, and so on of the core. This block is also pretty important. This is the PET-C parameters, essentially. It's, um, so we're using an eigenvalue executioner, and then uh, this is uh, how, you, how we configure PET-C, which is the underlying numerical library. Uh, in Moose, and it's uh, it's basically a suite of high performance solvers that's being uh, developed at Argonne National Lab, uh, and that's been around for a long time. Um, and then, with regards to the coupling, this is the most important part. So this is the multi apps and the transfer block. So this multi apps is in charge of creating this other simulation. So it's uh, as if I were running this input file, except this other input file, which is the which is prong on, except it's this input that's creating this simulation here. And then these make sure to transfer the these transfers move fields around around between simulations. So this one projects the power density from the neutronic simulation to the to prong horn. And while doing so, it makes sure 
it makes sure to preserve these two post processes, um, which is another word for a global quantity that we compute. And here it's power and total power, which is which are the integral of the power over the core. So it makes sure to preserve the total amount of power uh, when doing so. And these two other transfers are for moving information from uh, from Ponghon to Griffin. So very quickly, I'm going to run uh, this input file um, right now while we're going to explain the um, while well, we're going to explain the CFD simulation, just so we don't have to wait. It takes about, all right, where are we? Uh, oh, wrong folder. All right, so let's get back to the folder we care about. Um, and then let's get it running. Okay, so here it's creating the simulation. It takes about two minutes on this laptop. It takes a lot, a little long, a little less on my workstation. And right now, let's go look. Let's go have a look at the pronghorn input. So, pronghorn input, as you see, it looks a little similar. We define a couple of variables here. We define the so the phase fractions in the pebbles. Uh, some fluid properties, some reactor operating parameters here, the mass flow rate, um, the power when we're not using Griffin, because these inputs can all be run standalone as well, um, mass flow rate and so on. Same, we have a mesh block that's in charge of loading a mesh and refining it and also doing a few operations. So for example, on my mesh, I was missing a few side sets. So uh, for defining boundary conditions. So this is taking care of adding them. Um, and so for the for um, pronghorn, we still have a quite verbose syntax where we say, uh, where we define all the variables explicitly. So in porous media flow simulations, we define superficial velocities. So, um, these two variables are superficial velocities, then pressure, then the fluid and solid phase temperature. And these variables are going to be the variables in our equations, which are defined by kernels. So uh, as Abdallah mentioned, the mass equation for incompressible flow is just an advection kernel. Then the momentum equation um, is a time derivative, an advection kernel, diffusion, pressure gradient. And in porous flow, the most important is a friction term. With the Darcy and Forchheimer models. So, a bunch of equations. Um, it's important not to forget the term, uh, but it's uh, it's also this also can be done using actions. So the same as you've seen in Griffin, which makes the syn syntax much more uh, foolproof. Basically, here you see this power distribution field. That's where we're going to put the power distribution from Griffin. Um, initial conditions. Let's get to boundary conditions. So velocity at the inlet, pressure at the outlet uh, here, and then temperature in the out at the outside of the core and on the outer part of the core. And let's get to what makes pronghorn pronghorn, which is basically the material. So here we have all the correlations for um, for all these models uh, for each uh, for thermal conductivity for, um, so these for, what's that one? This is the expansion coefficient. These are uh, pebble bed heat transfer coefficient, drag models, uh, diffusivity. Um, so this is where we define all the properties of the, of the materials. Um, more properties, more properties, and then the Betsy parameters again, but that time for um, that time for coarse mesh thermal hydraulics. So it's not quite the same as for um, as for neutronics. And then another multi-app block. So why is that? That's for um, those are for the pebble the pebble simulations at the meso scale. So this is taking care of um, giving. Um, giving the, um, the phase temperature, the solid phase temperature and the power distribution, passing that down to the pebble simulations. All right, so how are we doing on this? So this finished. Uh, 
So uh, what should we look? Let's look at the output. Um, so let's, let's see. So this just finished, and we can look at the results. Yep, so that's uh, the result from our model. Um, so we just run a steady state calculation. So basically, uh, we matched um, we matched the thermal hydraulic solver in time up until it reached a steady state, and we run coupled neutronics calculations. Um, then we can look at the results. So this is uh, this fast flux. So this is uh, high energy neutrons. We can see it's mostly in the fueled region uh, that they peak. These are thermal neutrons, so you can see that it peaks in the reflector, uh, in the graphite, because that's where they're being um, thermalized. That's where neutrons are being thermalized. And then in the center, you can see uh, that there's a dip, and that's the control rod. Um, and then that was a couple calculations, so you can look at the, you can look at the, the salt temperature field that was projected onto the neutronics mesh, basically. Uh, and you can see that, this, as expected, the salt comes in through the bottom of the core, starts getting heating up, and then it leaves through here, uh, and it sort of peaks there because the mass flow rate's a lot lower. So why, why is this important, basically? Why do we want this uh, coupled analysis? It's because a lot of the, if you wanted to do like fuel performance um, of the pebble that comes through the bottom and does the, its whole trip through the core, we need to know its temperature history, its um, fluence history, sort of the, the radiation it received. And uh, that's something that doing this multi multi-dimensional analysis uh, provides us with. And um, and there's so many things you could, you may want to study. What if you want to study, um, as was uh, mentioned earlier, um, the pressure that the the life of the pressure vessel using another means code like Grizzly. Uh, this will this kind of simulation will provide you with the the neutronics dose, but also the um, um, yeah, but also the temperature field. Okay, so we've done this part. We'll, we're going to now try to adapt this model to another input file. So let's get to the third part of the tutorial. Up, and let's try to adapt this model to this mesh. So it's a different FHR geometry. There's no inner reflector. Uh, fuel still comes in through the bottom, um, but it's uh, it's different. The meshes, the side sets are different. The nothing's called a different way. Like it's just a different input, basically. So how would we adapt our input? Um, so if we go, um, so I've already moved those files, and let's try to adapt. Um, let's try to adapt the neutronics input. Okay. So what's happening is that we basically we first have to change the mesh. So we're clearly using a different mesh. So the mesh is no longer here. It's this one, um, and then. All of this was for the previous mesh. That was to try and uh, optimize for the previous mesh. So now uh, we've got to do a different mesh, a different operation. So what we're going to do is map this input to the new mesh, um, or map the new mesh to this input. So let's rename the block, basically. So here I have like this uh, autocomplete um, thing that is going on. And so that's uh, that's some sort of Atom plugin. So Atom is uh, the text editor I'm using that is uh, very convenient for using um, for using uh, most tools. All right, so we want to rename the blocks. Uh, so it's a rename block generator. Then we can look up the parameters. Um, Adam will provide us with a list. So we can go from um, the old blocks, that's one parameter. Uh, the new block is another parameter. Um, so what do we have? Um, actually, we can probably survive with the new blocks. Let's rename the boundaries uh, that will up and then. 
Okay, so now let's look at our mesh. Uh, so we can see that this site set seems to be, well, actually, let's keep the blocks. So this site set and then this other site set, um, these two are the center of the mesh. So let's rename those two site sets um, to be uh, what the older name was. So reflect the surface. Up. Then the top, we need to map uh, these three site sets to the top of the, um, to, yeah, to the top. I think the name was top. Let's look. It used to be called, ref, yeah, top and bottom. Okay. So these two side sets are there. Okay. You don't, so, you know, uh, 10 minute mark. Uh, uh, 10 minute mark. Okay. So let's just, okay. Basically, we adapt the input file. Uh, let's just, uh, let's just use another one. Okay. So, um, yeah. Let's just run it while we're adapting the input file. Okay, so we adapt every time, every, that's gonna take two minutes. So we've got two minutes to look at things. We adapt the sign sets, then we adapt the blocks uh, in the variables. We adapt, um, where else are there things? Uh, the materials are a pretty big one. We definitely need to adapt the materials. So this, this here was defined for block one, which was the inner reflector. So we no longer have one. So we just delete that. In this model, we don't have a control rod either. So we delete that. Uh, pebble bed is now, so it used to be block three. If we look at this mesh, um, it's no longer called block three, it's block 12. Okay, so we did add that to block 12 and so on for every material. Um, and so it takes about uh, 10 minutes, but uh, I want to get to the last part of the tutorial. So I just skipped ahead. Um, and it's the same procedure for the thermohydraulics, basically. Uh, you just adapt the, oh, we still have time. So you notice what it just did there. So we failed the time step. And so it just knew to restart automatically and try with a different time step. Um, Anyway, so let's look at uh, let's look at what we'd adapt in the CFD mesh. Um, so in the CFD mesh, we have a little more things to do. So in the CFD mesh, we also we would also have to adapt, uh, make sure to move the plenum and so on. Is that already done? No. Okay. Um, we very close. Okay, let's just okay, let's just skip ahead to part four for a little bit. Okay, so we're gonna go in the final part of Sam from coupling, and we're gonna look at the actually. I think I want to see this one. We're going to look at the fan mesh for a bit while the other thing is running. They also take they all take about two minutes to run. But okay, so this is our sand mesh. Oh, my bad. Um, let's try and zoom so everyone can see everything. Okay, so this is our SAM mesh of the FHR plant. So the FHR plant is um, basically, this is a lower plenum. You can show it like this. This is a top plenum. Here you have a core component, which we're gonna replace from SAM to pronghorn. This is uh, an expansion pool, so this is salt. Uh, and then, so this around here is the primary loop. Over there, you have the Drax, so it's a, a passive safety system. Um, and here is a high pressure, I think it was here. Here's the high pressure heat exchanger system, and over there is the high uh, lower pressure heat 
heat exchange system. And basically, uh, we are going to be coupling this plant model to a core simulation, a core mesh uh, CFD simulation of the core, which will fit in here. Okay. Um, is this over? Yeah, this is over. 188. I guess three minutes. My bad. Um, okay. So we can look at the results for the other one, and then we'll move to new to Sam from home coupling. Okay. And what we see. Okay. Wrong axis. So this is our new reactor. And what we see is we can get the flux distributions, the same quantities, um, but for the new uh, for the new reactor model in like it, it didn't take long to adapt the input file or run it. Okay. So and why does that matter? It's because when you're making your you very rarely start from scratch, right? When you're making inputs, you always start from someone else's work. And so that's kind of what I just did uh, here for the FHR. Okay. So final topic, Sam Pronghorn coupling. We have 10 minutes, so I'm just going to start running it now uh, and then explain what has to be done to do this. Uh, ooh. Okay, long one. Okay, so now let's look at the incomplete input file, the one I just tried to run uh, and uh, obviously failed. Uh, but I'm running the complete one and I'll show you what needs to be done in the same input file to couple. Okay, so let's go to the top of the input file. So SAM, the way SAM input files are, are uh, made or you define components and you define pipes between components. So for example, uh, this here is the core, core fuel. Um, and you define all the parameters for these components. Uh, let's go look at the pump. Uh, so this is a high pressure pump, for example. You'll see it's, so the high pressure pump is connected to the expansion tank uh, through this piping. Uh, and so on. Here you have all your pump parameters, your desired mass flow rates, and so on, uh, if you want to be uh, adjusting this. But how uh, would you couple this? So basically to couple this, uh, yeah, I think we need to get to that. Okay. If we want to couple this, we've, gonna, we've got to create a multi-app, okay? So we're going to create a multi-app for Pronghorn. So let's call it uh, Core um, CFD. It's going to be a full solved multi-app. Well, actually, it's going to be a coupling in time. So it's going to be a transient multi-app. The input, the name is combined. The I. And so all of this, this is all we need to run to run from home from SAM. So it's not a lot, but we do need to be exchanging information for the coupling. So we're gonna create transfers. Okay, so um, something we need to transfer, for example, is uh, so to from home. We need to give the inlet conditions of the core from, uh, from the plant model to the core model. So that's velocity and temperature, for example. So we're going to create a uh, multi-app reporter transfer that's going to be able to transfer uh, just like these post processes, okay? That's going to go to the multi-app. I think we need to specify which multi-app, so that's the course 50. Then we need to um, specify what we want to send, so the from reporters and where we want to send them, okay. Up. Okay, so what do we want to send? So let's look at what post processes we have. Um, post processes, okay. So we have, oh, we don't need that one. So we have, this is for the outlet, these are receivers, okay these post processes so the core velocity so that's from the lower part lower plenum to the core um, 
variable velocity. Uh, so that's the core inlet velocity. That's the core inlet density. Then we can compute uh, the mass flow rate from there. So core m dot is simply velocity times density times the area of that pipe, which I retrieved manually. And then here's the core inlet temperature. Um, so same component, um, but the variable we'll retrieve is temperature. So that's one quantity. The other quantity we want to transfer uh, is the, well, that's two quantities. The other one we want to transfer is the core outlet pressure. Um, so basically that's at the outlet of the core in the, in the plant model. So it's this one here. So we're looking at this pipe, the inlet to this pipe from the core to the upper plenum, basically. It's not really a pipe, it's a component, right? Um, and we want to transfer that. So let's get to the transfers. Um, so that was core V, core T, and core pressure, I think. And then, uh, then let's look at our pronghorn input. Um, oh, is that still running? Okay. Let's look at our pronghorn input here. Open this one. Okay, so our pronghorn input, we're going to want to fill these post processes um, because these are, so these are where the information comes in inside the, the CFD simulation. So here we want to receive the mass flow rate, the fluid temperature and the pressure. So that's what we need to set. Um, so for inlet. M dot. And I guess that was the poor M dot. Uh, T fluid and pressure. Okay. And I think that was hold outlet pressure. All right. And like just like that, we have we are sending data from Sam to Pronghorn. Now we need to send uh, the other data, which is from Ponghorn uh, to Sam, and that's still done by the by the master app, which is Sam here. So we need a multi-app uh, reporter transfer again. Uh, I guess these are similar, and then. Uh, same idea, we're going to have reporters in Pronghorn that we're going to send to uh, reporters in SAM. Okay. Uh, okay, so we're almost out of time. So actually what we're going to do, um, what we're going to do is we, and this is still running. Yeah, okay. So what we're going to do is we can just look at results while it's running. It, you can, it's totally legal to do that. So let's look at that. Oh, okay. So my Mac is trying to protect me from this file. And let's open. Let's get Excel to open that file. Hopefully. Yeah, it still knows. Okay. okay, cool. So it's not done. It takes about 2,000 seconds to get something that's truly converged in steady state. Uh, and so that takes maybe 20 time steps or something like that. But we've got 250 seconds done already. So if I still remember how to use Excel, it's this, this, and this. That will get me the temperature distribution with one of these plots. Um, this one maybe? Yes, okay. So that will let me plot in time, so that's the x-axis, the temperature at the inlet and outlet of the, of the core, basically. And you can do the same for like a lot of all the quantities that are 
computed in the SAM input file, for example. So there's the pressures, the temperatures, velocities, mass flow rates, and so on for every component. Here we have our um, whatever is there. Yeah, each pipe basically, all the branch to tank, all the tank inlets and outlets. Okay, and that's that's about um, that's about it for this input file. And so why does that matter? Well, basically, it shows that when you can couple um, something to SAM, you go from having just a core simulation to having a full plant simulation. So now we have some sort of simulator of this uh, of this plant uh, that can do a, a medium fertility soil for the so for the core. And I can do the thermohydraulics, uh, the balance of plant analysis at the same time. Uh, and that, that right now that was just steady state, but that can be adapted by just changing uh, the SAM uh, parameters to do a pump transient, to do a station blackout. We can do a lot of different things um, uh, from this. All right. And that's all I have for today. So I'm just going to share the acknowledgments. Uh, so thanks for the SAM team for sharing their alternate FHR model. Um, Jiren and Kazi Ahmed at ANL for the SAM model, Cole for having uh, worked on it, um, David for SAM from home coupling, and Fander and Yachi uh, for help with Ribbon. Uh, that's all I have for today. Thanks, thanks for your Guillaume. Great tutorial. Thank you a lot for walking us through all of the intricacies for changing the uh, inputs in the VTB for your end usage, both in terms of changing meshes and coupling new capabilities together. I'd like to ask all the panelists to uh, show their share the screen so we can start the Q and A session. Thank you everyone for bearing with us and thank you for staying on um, while we uh, go through all of our presentation and thank you for the panelists for very insightful talks. Um, uh, we have a few already. Uh, please keep them coming. Uh, this is open to anybody. Uh, I can take a stab at the first few. They're both related to validation question. Uh, that's a question we get a lot at the NEMS program in terms of uh, codes validation. There's a few uh, items to highlight here. Number one is, um, as you probably are aware, depending on the advanced vector type, some of them have never been built in the past. So that's uh, the case for Guillaume's uh, reactor, the FHR one that he was highlighting, for some of the molten salt and some variants of reactors as well haven't been built. Uh, of course, with some reactors like Explodium Fast Tracks and HGR, there's more data. And the NEMS program is actively engaged in conducting benchmark exercises to increase confidence in the tools uh, being used. Um, last thing I would point out, and so, sorry, point out that we are, they are in the pipeline for getting upload on the VTB. We already have some benchmark examples showcased. And just to highlight a few that are coming up, uh, there's an MSRE benchmark, uh, there is an HTTF, so uh, for um, high temperature gas reactor validation exercises, we have a uh, HGR vessel simulation as well coming up, a reactor startup from uh, HGR in Japan, uh, there's some SFR Boeing models that we're trying to, we're, we're hoping to, ho to host on the VTB next fiscal year, uh, this fiscal year I should say, and a range of others that are coming online. But ultimately, I, I would like to emphasize that this is, uh, you can't just validate a code for any reactor purpose, right? It's ultimately up to uh, applicants themselves for validating the codes for their particular end use. Um, so we'll, we'll obviously do our best to get as much as we can done with international benchmarks out of the way uh, ahead of time, though, first. I hope that answers the question on the benchmarking. And Derek, maybe you want to chime in a bit, too, as uh, Neve's deputy lead. So there's a number of models uh, in development within NEMS as well. The what used to be the app drivers area that's now multi physics applications is is developing um, models for FHR, MSR, HTGR, several different models that will hopefully end up uh, within the BTB as well. And and one last thing to point out is that uh, codes such as Bison already have their own very integrated separate effects test suite that they already test the codes to and Griffin as well. Um, a lot of these won't won't find their way to the virtual test bed because they're single physics, but a lot of them will ultimately end up in the virtual test bed too. Um, okay, moving on to the next question. Um, I lost track of them. How do you verify and validate the interface among the different tools overall when coupling of different physics is deployed? Um, so I guess that's 
similar to the validation question as well. So generally, you have to look at the parameter when you validate it and compare against different things and make sure that uh, you're agreeing with, say, with a reference solution. And also, there are checks that we do internally, like uh, conservation of mass, making sure things are, are being conserved between transferring between different codes. Um, yeah. I don't know if Guillaume, you want to add something there too? I'll just add that the interface between code the transfers is extensively tested. It's all they are used all over the the framework and over many applications. And um, so it's more about trying to respect the physics when you're doing these transfers by preserving the right quantities. Um, and I mean, there's no uh, yeah, there's there's no other sort of option of. If you do that, there's no better way in a way. Thanks, Guillaume. And if we haven't answered your question, feel free to ch send something in the box again or email us separately. Uh, next question is from James on uh, if there are any Griffin SN examples in the virtual testbed. Uh, I don't believe so, right, Guillaume? That we don't have. We only have uh, diffusion cases yet, but uh, we can connect you with folks on the Griffin side that have uh, examples and that will be eventually in the VTB, but aren't yet. Um, yes, and capabilities are fairly new. Uh, so we'll, um, we'll have an example within a year for sure, but um, not right now. Uh, number question number five, which code could I use to check department DNB uh, in a PWR? Would it be possible to operate for to be used for online DNBR calculation during operation. Um, so the majority of our inferences ha has been on the advanced reactor. Um, on the uh, PWR side, there are other tools in the on the Neiman umbrella, primarily developed by the Castle program. They can be used for that kind of application. Uh, Derek, maybe there are some initial capabilities within some of the Moose tools, but um, I think it's primary on the Castle side. Is that fair to say? Yeah, definitely. As I mentioned earlier, for all light water reactors, that's PWRs and, and BWRs. Um, we rely on the, the Vera code suite uh, developed within Castle uh, to do those calculations. So we it hasn't been a focus with the, the most based tools. And I think the particular code within Vera is uh, CTF, so Cobra TF, uh, if, if you're interested. Uh, Tiago, hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Right. Um, Next question, are there plans to extend the types of reactor within the VTB to more exotic designs, example, fission surface power designs? So yes, we are interested in having a wide range of, we call them challenge problems, so examples that kind of showcase a lot of the um, intricacies of, of, of different concepts. So uh, I would point you, if you're interested in fission surface power, to the micro reactor design that Nicolas Stove is the point of contact for. Um, it's a challenge problem in the sense that it includes heat pipes, triso particles, a lot of the, the Maybe you won't see that in a real reactor in, uh, uh, in, in real life, but it, it's putting in all of the key uh, standoff, standalone features that make this an interesting problem to consider. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure a lot of the applica applicability will be useful for efficient surface power. I believe at the NIMS um, annual review, Nicola also mentioned that they are interested in doing a benchmark of Krusty, uh, which is by definition, you know, the kilowatt hour project, so efficient surface power as well. So yeah, all of these, if they are um, non uncontrolled uh, models, will be hosted on the virtual testbed eventually. Um, question number seven from Andrea Alfonsi. Hey, Andrea. Um, what are the number of DOFs, degrees of freedom in this model? How many pro processors have been used? I guess I that's referring to you. Yeah, go ahead, Guillaume. Yeah, so it's 48,000 degrees of freedom, and it's been run on a MacBook with eight cores. Um, live with this thing, uh, with GoToSeminar hugging one of the core, but yeah. Yeah, I think that's one of the key misconceptions. People often think about Neem's tools as things that you need to run on a supercomputer, which there are a lot of codes like uh, Cardinal that April showcased that can be run on, and it should be run on supercomputers, but there's a lot of very useful analyses that can be done on just a simple work, but work testing. Yeah, I mean, that's the reality is that we're trying to create a graded approach so that if what you need is faster calculations for, you know, quicker design turnaround, uh, you can do that. And then you can have the higher fidelity calculations as well, either by just upping the fidelity of your geometry or utilizing a, a different tool. Like I mentioned, the, the several different fidelities uh, uh, for our thermal fluids codes 
uh, with, with Sam being the coarsest and then uh, pronghorn being kind of medium scale and then um, neck uh, um, helping us out with the high fidelity CFD. So depending on what your needs are, uh, we, we try to have a tool that you can plug in uh, for that particular kind of physics. Thanks, Derek. Um, we have a question for you, Guillaume, next. How often do you update those input files of the reactor models to ensure they are compatible with the latest version of the codes, um, of the most based codes? All the time. So basically, uh, they are checked automatically when people are modifying the codes. It lets them know if they are breaking our input files. Um, and then we work with them to update the input files as they update the code. Um, and we are also when we update the input files it's also checked against the latest versions of the codes to make sure that it uh, works and we use the git sub module system to sort of keep track of which version of the code works with which input file if there is any disconnect but we try our hard our hardest to not have any disconnect uh, between the latest uh, version of the input files and the latest versions of the code yeah, in fact, it's it's one of the important functions of the VTB is to maintain this repository of up-to-date input files that are going to work with uh, the newest versions of the code. Because the code does change over time, and so having uh, this large repository of input files that you can always go look at to get the truth for what's going to work with the codes today uh, is an important feature of, of the VTB. So they're, as Guillaume said, they're tied together in both directions. So as the codes change, we check against the VDB. As the VDB changes, um, those changes are checked against the codes uh, automatically. And that goes back to that software quality system I mentioned earlier, where we're running over 20 million tests every week on our uh, testing systems in order to make sure that these things continue to work together. Thanks, Derek. Next question, are there any examples of using the built-in mesh generator? I think that was highlighted at the NEMS annual review. Um, not at this stage, but it sounds like this is a, if it's an interesting feature, we'll make a note maybe that we should. I yeah, should mention the, up, oh, sorry, Guillaume. April, the upcoming November. coupling of Cardinal for OpenMC, THM, and Bison will use the new reactor module for meshing a prismatic fuel bundle, so hexagonal array of pins and coolant channels. It's a, it'll be a really good demonstration of this new capability. It's much simpler to use than commercial tools. Yeah, yeah. coming soon, stay tuned. Coming soon. So yeah, please. Also, you were seeing a little bit of it in Guillaume's input files where he was using the mesh generation system just to modify incoming meshes, which is a, an, another way that we utilize the internal mesh generation system. You might read in two or three pieces of a mesh, tie them back together, rename them, fuse them, that sort of thing, so. And it's a common use too. And, yeah, and just to reemphasize, uh, we're, we're continuously adding models to the VTB, so please do check in frequently as we're always adding new capabilities. Um, next question Is there any flexibility to build communication between Moose based tools like Grizzly, Carnal, or Blue Crab? Um, yes, definitely. It's kind of the point of Moose. I'm not quite sure I followed the question. Does anybody here want to take a stab? Sure. Um, so there's already the transfer system. Uh, that handles a lot of possible means that you would want the, these codes to communicate. Um, but yes, there is flexibility to add more things as well. Uh, and things are added as the needs arise. Uh, I, don't know, I think it would be good to mention dynamic linking too. Derek, do you want to describe that? Go ahead. Yeah, I, I'm trying to parse exactly what they were asking on that question. Uh, like, like. Guillaume mentioned, maybe we can get some clarification, but like Guillaume mentioned, all the Moose space applications natively have the ability to communicate with each other. <clears throat> Traditionally, the way that we would um, run a multi-application simulation that utilized more than one Moose based application is to actually compile them together. Um, but there is uh, another capability where you can compile them separately and then at runtime um, actually link them together dynamically. Uh, and that's a, that's a capability that is under further development uh, just this year to make it, to make it even easier uh, to do that in the future. That way, whenever you get um, binary versions of 
let's say um, um, you know, Griffin and uh, Pronghorn uh, through our new binary release system, um, you should be able to get both of those binaries and then have them talk to each other without having to recompile anything. That's not quite working just yet with our binary release system, but that's where we're headed. So I, hopefully that answers the, the question on the communication. Um, sorry, I think we're, we're running out of time, but uh, maybe we can just squeeze in one last question from Lane. Uh, hey, Lane, uh, how are the boxes? How out of the box is the virtual test bed, such as if a new, new user who is at least familiar with the tools able to start using it? My apologies. I mean, how much effort would it take to, for a new user to be using the virtual test bed? So that's exactly partly who we're targeting to an extent, Lane. So we, we we think it'd be great for you to, to to get to try to get started with this. We have new users to Moose that have started with VTB and found it pretty useful and uh, um, as a starting point. Uh, but we'll definitely open the feedback. If you think we can make it easier too, let us know. But we think it's already pretty much there in terms of helping first users. There's a lot of documentation on the tools. Um, for the specific codes though, you'd have to refer to the manuals if you're using SAM or Bison, uh, refer to those manuals for the capabilities there. But the VTP does a good job of explaining how you use these uh, codes for a specific use case. So, yeah, I mean, because of the way that the code development is tied together with the input file development, the idea is that you should be able to go to the NCRC, so that's inl.gov slash NCRC, get access to the codes on the INL high performance computing system, which they're already pre-installed on there. You should be able to log in, clone the virtual testbed directly to the INL HPC and immediately run a multi-physics reactor problem without editing anything. Um, so that's kind of what we're going for. So, you know, hopefully, hopefully we're able to achieve that goal of making it really, really straightforward to um, get up and running with these tools. Yeah, and we're, we're pretty approachable. So feel free to email anytime and happy to help you get set up with uh, the VTB. And I think uh, with that, we're out of time. So we probably need to conclude the session. Uh, thank you all for attending. Really appreciate you hearing us out and uh, we're really excited to, to working with the, you all in the future on the virtual testbed. Thanks again to Guillaume, Derek and April uh, for great discussions on the, the, the uh, presentation. And I've got, I think an email about people wanting the slides. Again, the, the recording will be available online on the NREC website shortly. I'll reach out once, when it is. Um, so thank you so much, everyone, and have a great day.